All right, so welcome to this first webinar in the Managing Through Crisis Summer Series presented by Michigan State University's Broad College of Business. My name is Marcy Stowell. I'm the Assistant Director of Executive Education at MSU. My role today is to moderate this session, sharing your questions with Charlie Ballard, the presenter. But first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sanjay Gupta, the Dean of the Broad College of Business. So Dr. Gupta, thank you for being here with us today and thank you for supporting this summer series. Thank you, Marcy. It is a great pleasure to be able to welcome all of you to Michigan State University and especially the Broad College of Business. Uh, we are uh, thrilled that you're able to join uh, as we try and share uh, with each and every one of you the thought leadership from Michigan State uh, this is a time of challenge for everybody, and we are hoping that through this series of webinars that we have put together for you, titled Managing Through Crisis, that our alumni and the business professionals will be able to get some takeaways that you can use to deal with the situations in your organizations. Uh, we uh, have a great deal of expertise that resides at Michigan State, and each week we will bring a new speaker and a new topic that is focused on relevant topics themed on the impact of crisis on strategy, on management, on business processes, on customers, and other issues. Uh, each one of these topics combines the passion the thought leadership and the research of our faculty. And they have gained insights and expertise into these issues and how especially crises impact businesses. Of course, if you're interested in learning further beyond this webinar, uh, please know that the Broad College offers uh, a series of executive education programs in many of these areas. And so feel free to reach out to us uh, we are committed to making sure that uh, we can support you in your professional development. And finally, uh, the Broad College is committed to diversity and inclusion, and, and we are grateful uh, that you have chosen to join this webinar series, a world-class educational experience. And I am absolutely thrilled that we are launching this with Professor Ballard. Uh, those of you who may or may not know, uh, Professor Ballard uh, was a professor of mine when I was in the doctoral program here at Michigan State University. So it gives me particular joy and it's a great privilege to be able to welcome him to launch the series. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Thank you for being here today. And now I'm pleased to introduce you to uh, Dr. Charlie Ballard. So Charlie, thank you for kicking off our summer series with your insights today on how crises are impacting our economy. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you, Marcy Stowell, for uh, uh, putting this, doing all the work that you've done to put this together. And thanks to uh, Dean Gupta for your leadership in the uh, in the Broad College of Business during some interesting times. Um, and uh, now I'm sharing my screen. So here it is, Managing Through Crisis Summer Series. And uh, my topic is the COVID-19 economy, looking into the, the abyss and beyond. And, um, you know, I, would be, I, I wish I could be um, in an auditorium somewhere looking all of the participants in the face, but uh, that's the nature of what's happened to us in the last three months that uh, we're doing a lot of things re remotely. So I'm, uh, even though I can't see your faces, I'm, I'm glad to be here with you. And um, uh, there's just no way to sugarcoat it. Nothing like this has ever happened uh, to, to our economy. Um, uh, the, the sharp, it's the sharpest, it's the most sudden downturn ever. Um, the employment losses are sort of in the ballpark of what happened in the Great Depression over a period of three and a half years, or in the Great Recession of a little bit more than a decade ago, in um, over a period of, of a couple of years. And what we saw was a tremendous loss of employment and output in a very short period of time. So unusual. And then let me, um, before I go on, uh, try to inject an element of humility into this. Uh, I don't think that economists are by nature the most humble group. 
but I, I, I think uh, I need to be humble because um, uh, how, do, how do we economists try to understand the world we live in? We observe events, we look at data from the past, and then we try to make inferences about the future. Well, the past includes mostly reasonably normal times. Uh, this is not a normal time. And so since we don't have any experience with uh, a, a downturn like this caused by um, a virus, or at least no recent experience, um, that means that our ability to forecast uh, is, is challenged. I mean, I'm going to give you some thoughts about where I think things are going. Um, but uh, there is a great deal of uncertainty. Um, and let me, um, just a, a fact, employment dropped by more than 20 million in one month in April. And here is a um, uh, graph. I'm going to uh, hide the thumbnail video so I can see a little bit better. Here's a graph of, of um, the number of people who have a job in the United States over a period of about 40 years. And you can see the recession of the early 80s. Uh, this is employment in millions. And you can see the recession of the early 90s. You can see the recession of the early part of the next decade. You can see the Great Recession of uh, uh, 2007, 8, and 9. And then, boom, there's 2020. So uh, dramatic difference. And I want to show you another way of looking at this. Uh, this is employment as a percent of employment of the amount of employment that we had in the United States at the beginning of each recession. So recessions uh, and the recovery from the recession, typically there's a downturn in employment and then it turns up. So at the beginning, what percent do you have of what you have at the beginning? 100% of what you have at the beginning. And then here in uh, red is what we used to think was a pretty deep downturn, the one of the early 80s, which was particularly harsh for Michigan. Uh, then here's the one in the early 90s, not as steep a downturn, not quite as fast a recovery. Then in brown, this is the, the 2001 recession, uh, very shallow recession, but then a very slow recovery. You, remember, you may remember from uh, 15 years ago, the phrase, the jobless recovery. It was a slow recovery. Then here is uh, what happened uh, in 2007 and 8 you notice that all of these recessions are quite similar to each other in terms of the trajectory of employment um, for about the first year or so. And where the Great Recession decoupled was in September and October um, of uh, 2008, when, when uh, Lehman Brothers collapsed, that made that recession into something very different. And you see a big, deep downturn. This little blip here is the temporary hiring for the 2010 census. And then it took a long time to get back. Well, compare all that to this, which is our experience in this most recent recession, February, March, April, May. Uh, this is dramatically different. Um, by the way, while, we're, while I introduced the idea of uh, how we need to be a little bit humble, uh, no economist, myself included, no economist predicted that employment would actually increase in May. That's because between late April and uh, between the middle of April and the middle of May, 10 million people filed for unemployment compensation. Uh, so on the basis of those data, which come in weekly, we all thought that there would be further job losses in May. We were wrong. Why? We're not fully sure. Uh, what we think is that um, some people, um, uh, even though there were a lot of layoffs, there were also a lot of hiring going there at the same time, a lot of churn. Uh, the other thing is that it may be that a lot of those people in, uh, who filed for unemployment insurance, they did so uh, they had been trying to file for unemployment insurance earlier, and uh, they were just unable to get their claims processed because of the huge demand, uh, uh, the huge stress that was put on the unemployment claims offices in every, every state. So um, we did have this little uptick in May, uh, but still uh, employment is way down. And you probably are well familiar with the sectors that have suffered the most. 
Um, leisure and hospitality is the, the one that's been just clobbered. Um, and uh, 7 million jobs less than we had uh, three months later and 2 million jobs less than we had in retail trade. Ironically, we've had some jo <laughs> substantial job losses in the healthcare sector, although that's beginning to come back because while the emergency rooms were full, um, uh, ordinary things and especially elective surgeries uh, were cut off and uh, that just had a uh, huge impact and that has really put tremendous stress on hospitals in terms of their finances. The, this was an, a, a little bit different of a recession in terms of who lost the jobs. The last several that I showed you some data for uh, were all what some people call man sessions. The job losses were disproportionately among men, uh, manufacturing, construction. Uh, this one was uh, is a um, female recession, uh, much more job loss relatively in, among women workers, um, much more among minorities, and also much more among low wage workers. Those are the people, uh, food service workers, uh, people who clean ho hotel rooms, uh, uh, all sorts of things like that. Um, people who work in nail salons, relatively low wage workers who um, were unlucky enough to be in, engaged in employment where they have uh, close personal contact with their clients and close personal contact is what we've had to uh, shut down or, or reduce. Big losses in health insurance. Um, I don't think we know exactly how many. The Kaiser Foundation had an estimate uh, that they came out with several weeks ago that by that time, 27 million Americans had lost health insurance. A majority of those, they expected to regain their health insurance when they were able to get back to work. But several million of those um, were not likely to get back to work soon and were not necessarily uh, eligible for Medicaid and so on. Uh, just looking down the road, uh, you know, um, we have been engaged in a running battle in policy uh, discussions in the United States for the last 27 years over how we should organize our system of health insurance. Believe me, that argument is not going to go away. Uh, I, I, some public opinions suggest that uh, public support for um, something like Medicare for All has increased, whether anything will be able to get into through a, the Congress, which has been uh, very deadlocked in, in many ways in recent years, uh, I don't know. Uh, but the debate is certain to go on uh, because we do have this system in the United States where a majority of Americans get health insurance through employment. And we've seen as a result of the COVID-19, we've seen the dramatic effect that can have on health insurance if there are big drops in employment. We saw that to a lesser extent uh, 11, 12 years ago during the Great Recession. Um, people have dramatically cut back on their spending. Uh, part of that is that uh, if, you, if you lose your job, your income has probably gone down, although you might have been able to get unemployment compensation to make up for it. But uh, I think a lot of what's going on is that those who still have a job are scared. When you see millions of people around you losing your job, you might wonder, am I going to be next? Um, and uh, big ticket purchases like automobiles saw a, a big drop. GDP fell at an annual rate of 5% in the first quarter. Now, where is it going to go from here? Well, I, I mentioned earlier that the, the estimates are all over the place. The Federal Reserve, and I know some of the people who work there, uh, good people, hardworking uh, folks who are doing the very best with the latest statistical techniques and everything, but they've got a, a range that by a year from now, the economy might be substantially smaller than it was in, in 2019 or it might actually have fully recovered and be a little bit larger than it was in 2019. Big uncertainty there. Um, um, we report in the United States, we report GDP on a quarterly basis. So all we have is the first quarter. 
Uh, second quarter, what will it look like? It may see some recovery, uh, but we will have to wait. Um, the second quarter is not even over yet, so we'll have to wait several weeks before we get second quarter GDP. But I, I saw in the news that the UK produces GDP on a monthly basis. They produce those data on a monthly basis, and their GDP is down 25% from a year ago. I don't think the US economy will shrink by a quarter, but the reason that I mentioned this about the, G, the, the GDP in the United Kingdom, by the way, the, the UK says it's the biggest drop in their economy since 1709, when they had really cold weather and they had some crop failures. Anyway, um, the UK economy is struggling. Germany's economy, Italy's economy in particular, uh, China, Japan, Korea, the whole world economy is down. Thus, international trade is down. And because of a whole variety of factors, including the, the uh, problems that we've had with having a supply chain of uh, personal protective equipment uh, that was unreliable because of international trade, I think there's going to be continuing pressure on international trade. Uh, I have mixed feelings about that because the growth of the trading system has been a sort an engine for the for growth of the world economy for 75 years. We now see protectionist sentiments. We see um, the uh, uh, Brexit in the United Kingdom. We see uh, the trade wars that we've had with uh, uh, China and other countries. Um, we'll see where that goes, but I do believe that there will be some downward pressure on the trading system. I think that many countries, just as a matter of national security, and that those many countries include the United States, I think there will be an effort to shorten the supply chain for uh, medical equipment and pharmaceuticals and so on. Uh, huge shifts in consumer purchasing patterns. You've, you're probably all aware of, of many of these. Um, brick and mortar retailing had been on a, had been falling relative to online shopping for years. And I think that's a trend uh, that has been accelerated. And three years from now, we will still have brick and mortar retail. We'll still have stores. But I think there are millions of Americans who had never really gotten used to online shopping who now have. And that means that I think uh, there will be the momentum toward more online and less brick and mortar, uh, I, don't, I don't see that slowing down. Um, eventually, I think we may re reach some sort of a stasis there, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's got a ways to go, I believe. Uh, restaurant spending has plummeted, grocery spending has soared. Uh, restaurants are beginning to open up, but at limited capacity. And, and until the virus is under control, I think restaurants, and a whole bunch of other things where people gather, sports venues, uh, uh, travel and tourism, the airline industry will be quite negatively affected for, for a while here. And then I, I saw the, the uh, here's a, an interesting uh, uh, side effect of, of all of this. Um, people are spending more on uh, their gardens, they're, they're doing home improvements, they're putting on an, an addition to the deck. And people are buying more trampolines, which means that there are more trips to the emergency room with uh, injuries due to trampolines. Uh, so that's a, a, a weird side effect of all of this. Now, so far I haven't painted a very pretty picture, but it could be worse. And, <laughs> and I'd like to just remind us, uh, uh, we often um, in recent months have compared COVID-19 with the influenza epidemic of a century ago or with the Great Depression. And there are some legitimate ways in which we can uh, make those comparisons, but we're a lot better suited in some ways. And I, I just mentioned three here. Um, we've had the longest, COVID-19 put an end to the longest economic expansion in American history more than 10 years, more than 10 and a half years. So um, what that means is that at least we had had that period of job and economic growth. If, if that virus had come along during the dark days of early 2009, uh, it would have been even more devastating. And, and by the way, 
Um, another thing is that we have a lot more people with high-speed internet access than we had not that long ago. Uh, the comparisons with the Great Depression, yes, we've had a big drop, which the drop in employment is sort of of the same order of magnitude as the drop in the Great Depression. However, adjusting for inflation per capita income is six times as high now as it was in 1929. Thus, uh, remember in 1929, millions of Americans did not have electricity, did not have indoor plumbing. Uh, a lot did, but not everybody. Uh, a lot of people did not own an automobile. Uh, a phone, a telephone was still something of a luxury item at that time. So at least we've got a little bit of a cushion from us, uh, decades of economic growth. And the last one in terms of the comparisons with the great influenza epidemic, which killed more than 600,000 Americans and uh, uh, many more overseas. The estimates for the deaths in India range from 12 to 17 million as a result of that epidemic. Well, an awful lot of the people who died did not die directly from the flu. They died because the flu weakened their, them and they were left vulnerable to uh, bacterial infections and of course, um, Alexander Fleming had not yet discovered antibiotics. I want to talk a little bit um, about policies. And if you were talking about public policies regarding these other recessions that I have talked about earlier, you would do so just in terms of traditional economic policies. You know, what do we do with uh, trying to um, alter the prices of, of goods and services? Uh, what, what does the Federal Reserve do to interest rates? What about fiscal policy, taxes and spending? But this one, public health policies are absolutely crucial. The policies to respond to the economic fallout are absolutely crucial, but the public health policies are also crucial. So that makes this one different from others because this one was caused not by a meltdown in the mortgage market, not by a spike in oil prices, but it was caused by COVID-19. There were other weaknesses that were exacerbated by COVID-19, but the public health uh, was what caused this. And I have to say, I'll be honest, uh, I believe that our public health response got better when we kind of finally woke up in March, but it was abysmal. Here's what, and, and I want to spend a, a few minutes on this because I don't think this is necessarily the last time that we will have a novel epidemic. I mean, in our lifetime, we've had HIV, SARS, MERS, Ebola, and now we've had COVID-19. Obviously, there are niches in the ecosystem. I wish this weren't true, but there are niches in the ecosystem for viruses. And viruses are mutating all the time. And I hope we don't get another one. But can I guarantee that there won't be COVID-24 or COVID-31? I can't. Thus, I think we need to learn some lessons from our uh, response to, to this crisis. Um, I think what we should have done by January, we knew what was happening, or at least the public health experts knew. The, a lot of people, I think, did not. Uh, I think we should have put the economy on a wartime footing. We should have used the Defense Production Act. We should have used the Defense Logistics Agency. We should have put the National Guard to work in uh, producing masks and uh, equipment and gloves and uh, and reagents and testing uh, and all sorts of stuff. We didn't do that. And that means that the outbreak hit us a lot harder than it needed to. Finally, in March, we began to have, uh, I think, more sensible public health policies, but I, I still wouldn't say that they're great. Um, the lockdown became so necessary to slowing the virus. And fortunately, here in Michigan, we've done a pretty good job but it became necessary because we're still behind in terms of our testing and tracing, not doing that as aggressively as I believe we should. Now turning to the economic policies. Um, and uh, uh, 
really we've started seeing the the economic fallout uh the the stock market had a very bad week in the first week of uh february uh, last week of february and then that turmoil in the financial markets led the federal reserve to make the first of their interest rate cuts on march 3rd another big interest rate cut basically to zero 10 days later and the fed has made massive massive interventions in all sorts of credit markets buying up corporate debt in a way never that they've never done before and i you know there is legitimate concern about when the Fed does that to its balance sheet, do you worry about inflation down the road or other things like that? Yes, you do. But when the house is on fire, you don't worry about the long term. You worry about putting out the fire. And I think the Fed's uh, aggressive actions have kept this, at least from the moment, kept it from being much, much worse. Uh, because what we saw in the Great Recession is that the com credit markets completely froze up, or at least several of the credit markets. And um, the, you know, in uh, September 17th and 18th of 2008, our financial system was about as close to systemic collapse as it had ever been, or as it, it had been in 75 years, um, 80 years. And then um, on March 16th of this year, we came close to collapse. Fortunately, we didn't go over the edge, and I think you have the Fed to thank for that by being a very aggressive, uh, injecting huge amounts of money into the credit markets. So uh, uh, Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, has said quite honestly, look, we can't fix broken supply chains. We, we can't come up with a vaccine. That's up to other people, but at least they have so far kept the credit markets from seizing up, and that has reduced the severity of this downturn greatly relative to what it would have been if the financial markets had completely frozen up. Uh, at the same time that the Fed is engaged in monetary policy, the uh, Congress and the president have engaged in fiscal policy. And uh, just here's a list of the kind of things that you've, uh, we've seen in these ser series of stimulus packages and uh, um, I won't go into detail, but have they worked? I would say that they've worked moderately well. Have they worked fabulously well? No, but I, I don't blame the authorities too much. I think there were some ways in which they could have done these things better, but um, uh, you've heard about well-publicized pro problems of some businesses that really did not need a loan, getting a loan. Some of them have been forced by the bad publicity to give the money back. And then some businesses that really needed a loan were not eligible for technical reasons. I think we're working that out. Uh, but, you know, um, if, if a small business has a delay of even a week in getting money that most of these small businesses do not have huge cash reserves. And so we have seen some businesses fail. Um, and I don't think we've seen the last of the business failures. The other thing is, uh, I say here, some of the channels through which fiscal policy is usually expected to work are unavailable. That's because the whole idea of fiscal policy is put money in people's pockets so that they will spend it. So what have Previous, what's happened in previous efforts to combat a, a recession, like the tax cuts that were passed in uh, 2009. Um, hey, honey, we've got a little bit more cash here. Let's go out to dinner and a movie. No, you can't go out to dinner and a movie. Um, you, you, let's, let's go on a vacation. Um, my wife and I like to travel a lot. Uh, we've canceled four trips that we ha would have done by now. We'd be in Denmark right now. Um, and so, uh, and that, as well as the, the uncertainty that I alluded to, um, that has meant that these fiscal policy initiatives have worked okay. They haven't worked fabulously well. Uh, but I, I say down at the bottom of the screen, they're a whole lot better than nothing. We know what nothing looked like. Nothing is what the Hoover administration did in 1929, 30, 31, 32, and it was not pretty.
but I, I want to get back to what I have hinted at earlier that uh, if we're going to ultimately get our economy back to where I want it to be, I don't think we do that until we defeat or at least largely cripple the virus. Um, because as long as you've got most Americans not immune to the virus, um, restaurants and hotels and airlines and all sorts of other things are not going to get back to normal. And so um, I, briefly, um, some people have said, oh, you know, there's the economy over here and then there's saving lives over here. This is an interesting situation because in my view, the economy and the public health are, are intimately intertwined. And I won't bore you with the details of the literature uh, that economists have on estimating the statistical value of a life saved, but a lost life has a real economic cost and um, the numbers are large, they're in the millions. So um, I think we need to move both on both fronts. We can't just uh, ignore the public health. We've got to move on the public health front at exactly the same time that we move on the economic front. So predictions about the future. Well, I love to quote one of America's greatest, America's greatest wise men, Yogi Berra, who once said, it's tough to make predictions especially about the future. Uh, and in a situation with this much uncertainty, you should, you know, I'm going to make a forecast. And there's huge error bounds around it. Take any forecast that you hear with many grains of salt. We're going, this is a work in progress. We're going to up, be updating our forecasts as we go along, as we get more information. But a common forecast that I have seen is that the economy will continue to move upward as it has in the last month or so as some things have begun to reopen. But I don't think we're going to get back to 2019 levels, uh, partly because the, the drop in the spring of 2020 was so large. It'll take, I think, until 2021 and maybe until 2022 until we get all the way back. And in fact, I've spoken to some people who's opinion I respect, economists who have studied these things, who think uh, it'll take longer than that. We'll see. And I'd like, uh, I'm, I'm looking at my watch, we've still got time for some Q&A, but I, I do, don't want to um, leave without uh, some comments about uh, sooner or later this is going to be over. I am not certain, but I'm pretty sure we're going to get a vaccine sometime in the next year. Um, and uh, then, of course, we've got the logistical challenge of administering that vaccine to 300 million people um, in the United States. And really, if we want to control it worldwide, it's a whole lot more than that. But I, I do think eventually COVID will be in the rearview mirror. We need to be thinking about what the world will look like at, at that time. One, we, one thing we know is that even before COVID, Corporate debt was increasing, personal debt was increasing, and federal government debt was increasing. We were, we were adding to the federal um, debt uh, a trillion a year in good times. This year, it may be something like four trillion, unprecedented amounts of debt being issued. And I think, um, I worry about that. Uh, I think sooner or later, I hope we can get back to more what I would consider more ba balanced fiscal policies. Because if we don't, here's a, here's a federal debt uh, as a percent of the gross domestic product all the way back to 1940. Here's the huge run up of debt in the Second World War. Actually, I'm okay with running up a lot of debt to if, if what we bought with it was the defeat of fascism. Uh, then, because our economy grew and we mostly balanced our budget, that ratio of debt to GDP fell for decades. But then, around 1980, in the 70s and 80s, the, uh, uh, the, the political will to balance the budget got weaker. And uh, for a, a time, we began running, running bigger deficits. Then here's the uh, late 90s when we actually balanced our budget. And then here's the run up of debt because of the Great Recession. Well, here is the official forecast. 
that it'll turn down. Well, those forecasts are, are out the window now. This is kind of what I think it'll look like in the next few years. And then what'll it be? I don't know. But if we don't get our, uh, our fiscal policy under control, I worry that the world credit market's appetite for US debt is not infinite. And if it's not infinite, if ultimately we push the credit markets too high, what will happen? We will have to offer higher interest rates in order to get the credit markets to soak up all that debt. And we're already spending way over $400 billion a year on interest service on the national debt. And that's with very low interest rates. So um, I think we need to be thinking about that. Um, and uh, I would put uh, many, if you know me, you know that I'm a big advocate uh, for education. Uh, I think it's, uh, it, we need to do better. And um, uh, I am hoping that if we have limited resources in terms of testing and tracing, that we devote an awful lot of those to our school children and our teachers and the ancillary workers in the public schools because um, I know that children didn't get as much education in the last couple of months of this school year as they would otherwise. And the longer we go, remember anybody who knows about cognitive development, you know that it's in those early years that so much crucial cognitive development is going on. And um, so I, can, I hope that we get back to school. In fact, I hope that we lengthen the school year to make up for some of the lost ground. And I think that's about all that I, had to say, here's a list of upcoming events. Um, and um, Marcy, do I turn it back over to you? How do we handle this? Yes, let's have a conversation. We've had a lot of really good questions. I've seen um, that there are a lot of questions. I was yes. focusing enough on my presentation that I didn't look at them. Why don't you throw a few at me? Yes, you bet. So I wanted to start with one a silver lining like you mentioned and then move into current state questions and then as we have time um, more future state questions. So the first one is what industries do you see flourishing going forward? Uh, flourishing. Anything where you can um, easily work remotely uh, I think. I think agriculture is going to do okay because we all need to eat. And fortunately, an awful lot of the work in the agriculture sector, agriculture is a small sector, but it's, a, it's an important sector. And it's a sector where farmers are not, they usually don't, they're not crowded all close together. Um, so that's, uh, you know, I, earlier I mentioned some things, uh, you know, home improvements. Uh, gardens, G go, to, go to your uh, nursery and your garden supply place. Lots of people, they've got more time at home, so they're planting more flowers and plants. Um, so there are a variety of, of sectors um, that I think are, are doing well. Um, are you going to ask me the flip side of that, Marcy? Uh, what <laughs> sectors, I mean, we know for the short term what sectors are doing badly. Uh, hospitality is uh, travel and tourism. But here's one that I kind of, I, I worry about office space because there are all sorts of, I'm, I'm on, the, uh, on the board of a, of a nonprofit here in Michigan with I think 22 employees and nobody's been in the office for three months and they've learned that they can re work remotely and that works well for some of the employees. Um, it works well for those who, for whatever reason, one of the employees w has a 90 minute in each direction commute and she hasn't had to do that. So um, I, I think a lot of organizations are gonna be looking at remote work. Yes, there still will be offices, uh, but I, um, I saw the report that in New York City, a large, I mean, there's millions of square feet of floor space in those offices. and. Uh, a lot of it is sitting empty. Some of it will probably never fill up again. And uh, some of it is being already converted to apartments. So um, there's going to be a lot of transitions. And do you, we've heard some reports that there's uh, sustained productivity in the work, remote work environment. Do you find that to be true as well? I think it varies tremendously. 
Uh, I mean, there really are uh, good economic reasons for getting people together uh, where they see each other uh, face to face. Uh, you know, you can't look somebody in the eye and shake their hand and close a deal in the same way remotely as you can in person. Um, I, uh, you know, and uh, there are all sorts of activities that people enjoy, uh, sports for instance, uh, concerts where we like getting together. So I think um, uh, there, there will be an effort to get people back together. But um, especially if you've got a workforce that's relatively young, which means more computer savvy than relatively old, a lot of those folks are finding that they can do just about everything remotely. And uh, so I think there's the potential for uh, productivity gains, but there's also, I think we're going to have to monitor it because of course, one reason why some employers like to have their employees there is that it's easier to monitor whether they're actually doing their work or whether they're uh, uh, watching uh, whatever video or doing, uh, you know, uh, going to Facebook. Yeah, agreed. And there's a follow-up question as well on a different note. Um, what segments of the economy do you believe will rebound, will rebound the fastest? Rebound the fastest. Well, when it gets time for the rebound, I think that uh, the hospitality sector will rebound the fastest because it's the one that has shrunk the fastest. And yet, I that doesn't mean that all will be rosy. I mean, there are restaurants that are not going to make it. Um, and uh, then, you know, uh, it'll be uh, a challenge to, to get that back uh, all the way. But I think that when, when, assuming I'm correct, that sometime next year, we will have made much more progress against the virus than we've made now. I think that there will be a rapid rebound in, in hospitality and also, also in brick and mortar retail because those are the, the ones that have suffered the most. Oh, the other one I think will have a, I think there will be a pent up demand for um, knee replacement surgeries and all sorts of elective surgeries that have been put off as a result of the crisis. And I think we'll get to the point where um, that pent up demand is, is surging. Oh, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, yesterday, I got my hair cut for the first time in three months. Um, the, the place, I think they did an excellent job. There, there was a, a, a woman outside. You had to have your online reservation. She took your name. She gave you some uh, hand sanitizer. And then nobody was allowed inside the salon unless there was a chair where they were, were going to be worked on. So there was no people milling around. But every chair was full because there were a lot of people like me who hadn't had a haircut for a while. And I think uh, uh, lots of people are going to have, uh, when they can, they're going to get back to that, the nail salon and get their manicure and their pedicure and all that. Yes, agreed. Um, and so let's switch gears and talk about the federal budget deficit. Um, what do you think the long-term impact will be from significantly increased debt that the U.S. government incurred as a result of the current fiscal response? Yeah, uh, well, that's, I was uh, talking about that late in my presentation. I'm, I'm concerned. I'll tell you honestly, I've been concerned for decades. Um, you know, after the Second World War until the late 60s, somehow we had enough political will to raise enough taxes to pay for the spending. And then that political will has mostly broken down. We've only had, since 1969, we've only balanced the federal budget four times. 97, 98, 99, and 2000. Um, and you saw the graph uh, earlier for the, the huge increase in, um, in our debt relative to our economy. I, I, I think that we made a mistake to have a big, big tax cut um, in, in 2017, uh, which meant that we already uh, were uh, running big deficits even before COVID. 
and and I, um, you know, this is why I'm not not ever going to be elected to public office. But I think we should we should find a way to raise some taxes and possibly trim some spending. But if we can't get back, what will eventually? Ha I mean, there I think there's a danger that sometime and and the nature of financial crises is that six months before it hits, we won't know. It's it's only when right when you get up to the crisis that it becomes clear that there's going to be a crisis we could be greece we could be argentina i don't want to be greece or argentina with with a a, a crisis think about it I, I mentioned that we're already spending almost half a trillion a year on interest on the national debt and that's at very low interest rates what if as some economists believe and i don't know but what if we get some more inflation after this is all of, is over. Well, the inflation will certainly get built into interest rates. And even a one or two percentage point increase in interest rates will greatly increase that debt service. And so you can see how that could be a spiral. We're spending so much more on um, debt service, we can't keep up with it. Uh, and that's what turns you into Argentina or Greece. So um, if, if you're out there and you're listening, um, please, uh, after this is over, we let's try to do some things to to uh, gain a little bit more fiscal balance. And we're listening. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> All right. Um, and from a state perspective, pretty much the same question. What are your thoughts on how the state government's going to rebound from the budget deficit and loss of tax revenue? Um. That's a very uh, big and right now mostly unanswered question because the federal government has released uh, some uh, funds uh, to the states. And the states, every state has had a, a big drop in revenue, every state, no, there's no exception. And uh, Michigan is like the rest. And you, you probably saw, I was uh, in the middle of May, the revenue estimating conference that they're talking about um, billions of um, revenue losses. Well, the federal government can just run, issue debt. Uh, state governments are greatly restricted in their ability to issue debt for normal operating expenses. And so if, um, I, I, as I understand it, every state governor is pleading with Congress to A, loosen the restrictions on the money that's already been given, and B, uh, provide more money. Um, and um, the other thing that the state can do, uh, thank goodness, we um, accumulated a rainy day fund of uh, more than a billion dollars. It, it won't solve the problem, but I, if this ain't a rainy day, I don't know what's a rainy day. So uh, I think it would be appropriate to use a substantial amount of that. If it, uh, the, the, the best, of course, would be uh, if, the, if the feds can fill a substantial amount. Second best, use our rainy day fund. If after that we're still short, then you face some, Governor Whitmer and the legislature will face some extraordinarily difficult decisions because either you got to raise taxes, which is not going to be any fun, or you're going to cut spending. And what are you going to cut? You're going to further cut uh, money for K through 12 schools. Uh, uh, you're going to, I mean, you're going to put people off of Medicaid. Very, very tough decisions. Yeah, so we've talked about federal state government. I wanted to ask a couple of questions about industry and then wrap up with personal lifestyle impact and maybe second wave. Um, so my question on you know, forgive me for asking you about higher ed right now. That's obviously my passion. So can you speak to the current university financial situation? Um, and, you yeah. know, things like athletic, I know, things like <laughs> athletic restrictions, face-to-face -face disruption, changes in career demand, changes in budget. Uh, it's bad. It's uh, actually uh, the two universities that I know the most about are Michigan State for obvious reasons and the University of Michigan. Uh, my grandfather, my son, and much of my money went to U of M. The U of M is in uh, even worse shape than we are because their finances are so much tied up with the medical center. 
um, and me the medical center at U of M, like hospitals all across the country, has had huge drops in revenue. But it's bad here. Uh, I believe the estimate for this fiscal year is that uh, uh, our MSU's uh, budgetary losses will be in the tens of millions. And then for next year, perhaps a few hundred million. I um, am, uh, and various things are being cut back. Uh, um, building projects have been put on hold or canceled. Um, I am gonna get a salary cut. Um, there's a formula I, I looked uh, up uh, yesterday. I think I'm getting a, a salary cut of two and a half percent, something like that. And um, others will get different amounts ranging from some people not being cut. Uh, they're, they're trying to, at MSU, we're trying to take the most uh, away from those who can most afford to give back. Um, uh, and so, uh, and, and then there is the concern about, uh, you know, I mean, there are all those people who were expecting to sell hot dogs at the football stadium, and a lot of that's not going to happen. Uh, my, my best guess right now, based on the information I have, is that football will go on, but you're not going to have 75,000 people in Spartan Stadium. You're not going to have 110,000 people in the big house. Um, also, dormitories uh, are a, a major concern uh, at, at every university that has uh, dormitories. So uh, a lot of universities are changing their schedule. We're going to be completely online after Thanksgiving because we are trying to not have the students go away and then come back. Um, so many, many changes are being made at universities. Uh, not all of them easy, but you know, we're forced to, uh, to adapt to a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is a more positive question. Why, oh, good. Is, <laughs> why is the stock market doing so well and recovered so much since March, given the reality of increasing lockdowns, job loss? The U.S. Yeah. stock market seems to be moving the opposite direction. Yeah, uh, the stock market. I, I, would, I would ask most people not to pay a whole lot of attention to the stock market. Obviously, if, if you're in on this uh, webinar and you're a stockbroker, you have to pay attention to it. But I, I sense an increasing disconnect between the stock market and the lives of a very large fraction of Americans. Remember, uh, most Americans don't have any wealth. They're living from paycheck, or half roughly, are living from paycheck to paycheck. So for them, the stock market is, is irrele irrelevant. Um, I, and also the um, uh, stock market, so I mean, what is it that would push up share prices? Um, anything that push up, pushes up expected corporate profits. Um, but a lot of the things that push up expected corporate profits are not necessarily good for the economy as a whole. I mean, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation there. The other thing is that uh, just in terms of trading mechanisms, so much trading in, on the stock market is now uh, done uh, by computer algorithm. And a great deal is done, um, there are people who are betting on volatility and so making, uh, tr tr trying to get the stock market to have bigger swings. Um, so, um, you know, I, the, the one thing that I would say if you're an investor, uh, I've got a stock market portfolio, but it's, it's in a mutual fund so that no one stock imposes a great deal of risk on me. Also, as I've gotten closer to retirement, I have reduced my exposure to stocks because of that volatility. And the other thing is, I don't look at my account. Because the only thing, you know, the time when you're most tempted to look at your account is when you hear a couple of weeks ago, the, the Dow Jones is down 1800. Well, if you look at your account on that day, it's not, I mean, you can't change the facts and all it's going to do is give you an ulcer. So uh, I, my, my uh, strategy for the last 40 years has been just to invest every month in a balanced portfolio and, and then hope that my, uh, my money managers do as, as good a job as they can. Yeah, it's hard to look at that balance. <laughs> Anybody, I mean, I am convinced, and I think I'm a pretty smart guy, but you know, 
if you're a day trader, you might make some money if you're really, really good, but you might lose your shirt too. And I, yeah. I have never tried to time the market. Timing the market is only a good idea for you if you have a great deal of tolerance for risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so two more questions here. The, the next one is related to the unemployment benefit policy, the extra $600 that were extended. Um, do you think that was good or bad? Are you indifferent? And then part B, what if this is not extended? What will be the impact of that? I, I, so those, those are two good related questions. Um, um, there, there's been a lot of concern that $600 a week actually more than fully replaces the earnings for some workers. And some workers thus are reluctant to go back to work because they would end up losing money. I, I think that what is likely if you can, well, let me back up. I said likely using the word likely to describe the United States Congress is, is a risky uh, enterprise. Uh, I kind of think that we might get some kind of compromise where that weekly amount is reduced, but where the benefits are extended. Because um, I, I think that by the end of next month, there will still be a high unemployment. I, I, yeah, we saw this uptick in May, and that's great. But um, for reasons that we've talked about already this afternoon, I, I think that there will still be millions and millions of unemployed people um, going into August. And if, uh, if there isn't some kind of um, support for them, uh, after all, remember many of the people, uh, a disproportionate share of the people who lost their jobs are people who didn't have much of a cushion. People who didn't have a lot of savings, low wage workers, uh, and, um, you know, if, if they're left completely high and dry, I, I think you have a uh, destitution of a type that frankly, to, to my moral sense is it, it, it's offensive that if we would have severely destitute people in a country that's as affluent as, as ours. So I hope that we can, we have one of the, so, one of the weakest social safety nets among all the rich countries in the world. And uh, I wouldn't want our social safety net to get, be frayed much more uh, during a time like this. And then the last question I wanna land on for a minute. Um, do you think we know enough now to predict how a potential second wave may affect the economy? Yeah. I, I think of a potential second wave is, well, in fact, uh, the first wave is not over. Uh, what is the number? Uh, more than 20 states are seeing uh, increases in infections, and some of those are seeing rapid increases. Um, and I, um, I think if we get a second wave that is even remotely like the first wave, I mean, uh, you know, the first wave had this this character where the first two weeks in April were simply horrifying. And then after that, it got slowly but surely better. Now, instead of losing 2,500 people a day, we're losing only a few hundred people a day. But still, if, if we were to have a surge, and I think it, un, unfortunately, it could happen because I don't know whether we've got enough testing and tracing in place to prevent it from happening. And then, of course, you see some people who are um, um, ostentatiously not wearing masks and not practicing social distancing. Um, if we get a second wave and if it's big enough, it will do damage to the economy. I mean, it'll make some people sick and they won't be able to work. It'll kill some people and they sure won't be able to work. Uh, it will cause further so social dislocation and, and uh, so, I really hope that we do everything that we can to avoid or at least reduce uh, the possible second wave. Thank you very much. You've been so generous with your time and with letting me ask you so many questions on different topics. Do you have any final thoughts you wanna share as we wrap up today? Oh gosh, final thoughts. Well, um, 
you know, we're going through a storm unlike any we've ever gone through. Um, but uh, I, I hope that we as Americans can find some so, some solidarity out of this and, re and recognize that we've all been affected and try to uh, move in a, uh, in a direction that's, uh, that brings up everyone. Uh, I, I, that's probably a little bit bland and vague, but uh, um, uh, how about this? Life is short and we do not have too much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. That's probably a good way to, to finish up. That is excellent. Dr. Baylord, I always learn so much when I listen to you and you provided some certainty in an uncertain time, which I know all of us appreciate. And then you give us the extra at the end of this inspiring message. So I appreciate that very much. And for everyone that's watching, thank you for submitting your questions. I know we didn't get to all of them. There were so many good ones. So hopefully we covered um, what was of interest to each of you. And I do hope you will join us as we continue through this series all summer. Um, and I will see you all next week. Marcy, are you gonna po post my slides somewhere? Yes, we will have a recording of this webinar po posted on the Broad College YouTube channel. So I'll Good. send a link through Zoom um, that right. will direct each of you to that recording as soon as we're able to get that posted. Great. Yeah. I'm happy to share. So thank you very much for, for everything that you've done to make this possible, Marcy. You're welcome. All right. We'll see everybody next week. Bye now. <laughs>